<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Talk Now Radio. This is your host, Royce Redneck Radio Man. Uh, joining me today is supposed to be Michael Tellinger. However, he appears to be having some difficulty with his Skype, so we may not be able to conduct this interview. Uh, he had to step away for just one moment, and he's going to come back. And when he does, he's not going to know we're already live on the air. So, um, <laughs> going to be some interesting conversation there at first. Um, I thought I'd go ahead and start the show, explain to everybody that he was having trouble. Uh, his call keeps getting dropped. Uh, we don't know why. We may have to reschedule for a, a later date. I doubt we can do one uh, this month. This month's pretty well booked. But we might can reschedule for a date in July. Well, it looks like I just lost them all together, folks. He may have had to restart his computer. Let's wait and see if he shows back up online. <clears throat> and in the meantime... Well... Okay, I think I'm getting them back. While we're waiting on Mike, I'd like to remind everybody that I've got a busy week this week, so there's plenty of shows lined up for everybody. Later tonight, I'm going to be interviewing... uh, Gloria Brown about invoking the ancient scribes of Egypt. And then I'm going to have another show tomorrow morning, or tomorrow evening, I mean, with Timothy Wally on uh, Confessions of a Rebel Angel. And then this Saturday, uh, Andrea Perron's going to tell us about the movie The Conjuring that's due to hit the uh, theaters on the 19th. Mike, are you there? Yeah, I don't seem to be able to get him back. I don't think. Mike, are you there? I'm here. Okay, Mike, we're live on the air, but you appear to be having difficulty on your end. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. It just keeps cutting out. Well, let's see. Let's hope it um, it keeps us connected. Um, Maybe... um, if I call you, it seems to be stable now. It's lasted longer than before. <laughs> so let's keep going for it. Okay. We'll go ahead and try it. If it cuts out again, what we can do is we can always reschedule, but it'll probably be uh, for the end of July if we have to do that. But let's try to see what we got now. Good. It seems to be stable now. Okay. I was just telling everybody that you was going to tell us today about your most recent book. Um, well, i got to come down to it now. Uh, African Temples to the Anunnaki, and this book is based on uh, actual archaeological research that you've conducted yourself, am I correct? That's right, yeah, it's um, it's uh, uh, quite an incredible discovery. Well, the, the, the ruins have obviously been there for a long time, um, and they've been a, a center of a lot of speculation, and um, and a lot of you know, writing, but um, nothing really of substance has ever been written about it. It's normally the same <coughs> kind of speculations about the fact that they belong to, you know, um, migrant tribal migrant tribes uh, building them, um, and and so forth. But uh, yeah, the the it, what what is really important about this journey and discovering the stone circles of southern Africa and trying to figure out what on earth they're all about is a is a is a wonderful story in itself. Okay. Now, um, from what I gather, reading the description of the book, this is a huge, huge area of land that's got a like a big vast city built up in it. Uh, you know, can you kind of give us an idea? How big the city is? Would it, would it compare to, say, Samaria or somewhere like that? Oh, it's it's huge. You know what what people can do for themselves is just go go onto Google Earth 
and start looking around Southern Africa and um, look around the towns of um, Waterfall, Boven, the little town that I live in, and then the surrounding towns and just keep moving away from there. Uh, look around the town of Rustenburg on the way towards Botswana and um, and you'll start seeing these these large clusters of circular structures. What you'll notice though on Google Earth immediately is that they are not necessarily visible above the surface. What you're witnessing is actually st structures that are covered by soil and grass, but they are still visible um, from aerial photography. And that is really, I think, the, the main thing that, that has caused us to, or enabled us to start discovering these, is the technology from satellite um, um, visibility that has allowed us to see these structures. Otherwise, they probably would have still been lying buried beneath the soil and nobody ta takes any notice of them and the farmers keep plowing into them and, and wondering what on earth these things are. And, you know, historians would carry on writing the same nonsense and, and disinformation about it. But many people have uh, already, you know, responded in various emails to me saying, wow, they've discovered it and been looking at it and they start sending me some interesting information um, sometimes I've not seen it, and, and that's great. So this way we keep educating and informing each other. Okay, now, uh, just, oh, I'm just sorry. To, sorry just, to, just to answer your, your question, because um, I digressed a bit, is it covers, it covers pretty much all of Southern Africa. Uh, you don't always see it. It's not continuous, but you see, you know, um, so highlighted areas and concentrated areas here and there. But it covers most of South Africa and pretty much all of Zimbabwe, um, and it's obviously all connected to gold. Oh, it's connected to gold. Oh yeah, it's it's all connected to gold. It's all all about mining gold. You know, there there have been more than seventy five thousand gold mines discovered just around one little town of Leidenburg, and uh, and just just that alone is just spectacular. If you have to extrapolate that number of mines into the rest of Southern Africa, there'll be millions of them. And these uh, mines, they've actually still got gold in them, and they're, you know, profitable? Oh, <laughs> they still have gold in them, and the reason these mines were discovered, uh, I'm referring specifically, um, before people get the wrong idea, I'm referring specifically to a specific kind of mine, that they're known as ADIT mines, A-D-I-T, that go into the side of the mountain. It's like tunnels into the mountain, so they, they don't go down into the ground like mine shafts that we think of today, um, with hoists and skips, you know, so they go straight into the side of the mountain, and um, what happened here is that in about the year 2000, uh, one of the large mining corporations here, I believe it was Anglo-American, um, which for, for 100 years was one of the largest, what well, I think it was the largest mining company in the world, um, and uh, so Anglo-American wanted to uh, start, um, wanted to uh, explore how many of these added mines there were, because these mines were very actively mined in the in the gold rush in South Africa, the way that California had a gold rush and Australia had a gold rush from the mid 1800s towards the late 1800s. Same thing was happening here, and. Um, and during that period, they discovered um, these these added mines into the side of the mountain, which have been there for a long time, and they started reworking those mines. Uh, and the reason I say this is because all of these um, added mines are actually always in close proximity to the stone circles, to the stone, circular stone ruins. And um, so what happened now is Anglo-American wanted to... See how many of these mines they were. They wanted to catalog their locations so they could go in and close them off. Now, the reason they wanted to close them off is they just wanted to prevent anybody from mining <laughs> these mines, these old mines, and trying to extract gold from them. But once they got to the count of 75,000, they realized that this is a bridge too far and it's probably not financially viable to send out you know, building teams and engineering teams to start closing up these mines <laughs> to prevent people from beginning to mine. Yeah. 
So it's all about greed. You know, it always comes down to money and greed and control, unfortunately. Yeah, it always has. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, over, and above, over and above that, Royce, there have also been, I've had two independent reports from, um, from two guys uh, that independently told me about their grandfathers who were mining gold in the northern part of South Africa, just below the Zimbabwean border. And in the 30s, this is in the 1930s, and uh, at 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 about a hundred feet, they started stumbling upon um, tunnels, unexpected tunnels underground, that that were filled with interesting tools and artifacts. And obviously, they were perplexed by this because they didn't expect to stumble upon ancient tunnels. They were the first to be mining there in their mind. And uh, when they called the mining authorities at the time, which were known as the Marensky Reef people, they came to investigate and they confiscated all the tools and artifacts and uh, I believe they also prevented them from carry on, carrying on mining there. Um, but they took the tools and artifacts and they, their answer was, we are aware of this. So they were aware of the, these tunnels and the phenomenon of ancient tunnels, but obviously kept very quiet about it. And I believe that what these guys found in the 30s by accident, while mining themselves, is stumbled upon ancient tunnels of the Anunnaki um, that are just prevalent throughout all of southern Africa. And the reason I can say that again is because uh, I've been working with... Um, Klaus Donner on uh, on finding uh, you know interesting tools and artifacts hidden here in southern Africa in the Anunnaki gold mining empire, and uh, we found some fascinating um, information from using technology that show us a lot of a lot of uh, previously unknown and hidden tunnels under the ground um, with some very interesting indicators of what is hidden in them. Well, that sounds very fascinating to me, but I forgot to at first with the, you know, connection trouble going on, mention that your website is www.michaeltellinger.com and the call-in number is 832-632-7904 if you want to ask Michael a question. And if you want to attend the show live, it's www dot talknowradio.com I always love to have you in the chat room okay now Michael one of the guys at Facebook if memory serves I think his name was Richard Thomas made the post about how much he loved your book because he said it absolutely proved science wrong can you enlighten us on what you're in your book that might have proved science wrong about something well, yeah, it, it proves a lot of things wrong. It proves history wrong. It proves archaeology wrong. It proves science. I suppose uh, in some ways it proves it wrong, but what it does, it actually enhances our knowledge of science. Uh, and and um, first of all, it pr- proves history wrong because nothing has ever been written about human history um, 200 or 300,000 years ago um, regarding advanced activity, uh, you know, by human beings mining gold, that's just a completely, you know, that's a no-no, a no-go zone for most historians. Um, Archaeologically speaking, uh, you know, when you start talking about uh, ancient civilizations that go back 200 or 300,000 years ago, most trained archaeologists who have been sort of sticking to the to the textbooks and the the stuff that they've been taught at university will shy away from this kind of information. So it proves them wrong for sure because the evidence is there. You can't lie about it. You can't hide it. It's there. And you know, then more than ten million of these structures. That's <laughs> not as if you can run away from them or hide them. And then when I started discovering the the fascinating tools and artifacts around the stone structures and inside the stone structures, and scattered throughout the mountainsides in between them, um, which is incidentally just a never-ending lattice of, of stone uh, terraces and agricultural terraces. It's like a giant spider's web that seems to hold it all together. And um, the, the stone artifacts and tools um, give us a clear indication of 
some strange activity, doing, performing tasks and activities that make no sense to us today using the kind of technology that we use today. You know, mechanical drilling and mechanical machines and hoists and skips and bulldozers and front end loaders and that kind of stuff. So none of that kind of stuff exists, but some tools and artifacts exist that suggest that whoever they, these guys were that were building these structures and using them to mine gold um, had an advanced knowledge of the laws of nature, the laws of physics, and understanding how to use sound as a source of energy. Um, and that's just spectacular. Okay, so they were using sound as a source of energy to, um, what, like uh, bust holes into the mountain for the tunnel or... Yeah, there were, there were first of all, the, the stone circles, every stone circle that we've measured um, gives off um, very intensely and high sound frequencies into the gigahertz, um, sometimes into the hundreds of gigahertz, which is just unthinkable and unimaginable in nature. Um, and, and, you know, so the sound frequencies come only out of the stone circles. Nothing is going on outside the stone circle when you take a measurement and that's just absolutely perplexing. So it tells us about sound, and then as a result, the inside the stone circles, there there are incredibly strong and powerful electromagnetic fields that run either horizontally or vertically out of the ground into the sky. And it's only those two directions that they seem to run. We have not yet measured... Uh, electromagnetic fields coming out of the sky into the ground. They're all coming out of the ground into the sky, which suggests that the sound frequencies that are, that are created by the stone circles are generating in, in the circular um, structure of the stone ruin are generating electromagnetic waves and electromagnetic activity as a result of the sound. And that's really important because many scientists and researchers like Herbert Froelich, for example, have been saying this for a long time, that that sound is a precursor to electromagneticism. And if you read your Bible and if you read all uh, most ancient texts and the stories of creation, they all talk about that it was the word of God or the sound of God or the Om or the the various, some sort of sound frequency or, or resonance that was responsible for manifesting the universe and all things in it, out of which emanates the electromagnetic universe. So this is this is really mind-blowing stuff. So it's 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 certainly highlighting many interesting things in the field of science to us and proving science to be wrong on many fronts, like you you mentioned, and suggesting that sound can be used for everything, from levitation to drilling and separating um, minerals and metals to crushing ore to the finest powder and then separating it, vibrating it so that the, the matter and the materials separate from each other. Just like you can separate oil from water in, when it's, you know, in, in, a, in a vessel anyway. If you've got oil and water mixed, you expose it to certain sound frequencies, the oil starts to conglomerate and forms these beautiful globules on top of the surface of the water, and starts to actually pull together. So all the globules start to attract each other and start to amass into an uh, ever-growing pool or or, or a a bubble or a, 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 what do you call it, a a blob of oil, um, and completely separates from the water. And, you know, that that obviously, I'm sure that everyone listening to this, uh, or that will listen to it, will figure out that there's an immediate solution for us to stop poisoning our oceans from, you know, when we have disasters and oil spills, and then just rather use the simple um, logic and the simple ability of uh, and the, the method of sound to separate the oil from the water and just scoop it up and gather it and take it away. Yeah, because they had that uh, oil burst right out here in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, out by Galveston here a few years back. Something like that would have come in awful handy. Exactly, and what what do they do? They go out there and they spray poisons in the, into the water, all kinds of stuff. They just poison our water, poison the fish, poison the people, 
And, you know, you know, I believe, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, this is all very carefully orchestrated. It's just part of the ongoing onslaught against humanity. You know, from, from uh, poisoning our water with fluoride and all kinds of other chemicals to poisoning our oceans when these kind of things happen. And um, <clears throat> I also believe that sometimes they do it on purpose so they've got an excuse to poison the oceans. And, you know, the chemtrails that are just becoming so obvious and so incredible now, the chemtrails are just ridiculous. They're just everywhere. Poisoning our, our, our rivers and our lakes and, and our crops and the land and making them infertile, poisoning our bodies with all kinds of weird things that fall on us from the sky. Um, yeah, chemtrails are, you, you see them everywhere you go. Yeah, I think the agenda is pretty clear by now. You know, people that are waking up to it now are, probably going, oh my goodness, what's going on? <laughs> those those that have been watching it for you know the last decade or so have 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 become accustomed to it and they're just sort of trying to figure out a way of how to move beyond it or, or try and negate it. But if, if you when you wake up to this today it must be quite horrific. Yeah, you would think so. I know I've heard people report to me in uh, various groups that I'm in and various networks that where they live uh they got a lot of uh, chemtrails there, and they're ending up getting boils and uh, all kinds of, uh, like, skin cancers and stuff like that that they blame on the uh, actual chemtrails. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I live in the middle of nowhere, and, and even here we get uh, the odd occasional chemtrail. So no. it's, it's everywhere. No, I don't think any place is untouched, just like uh, virtually no part of the world is untouched by the by the greed and the the control of the banking families, uh, it, they just they, they, their effect seems to be reaching everywhere. Yeah, big time. Now, um, also, I wanted to talk to you about your, the pictures in your book. As I'm given to understand it, you've got over a hundred pictures, and many of them are uh, aerial views of the uh, actual uh, archaeological finds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the pictures are, they're, they're well over 100 photographs, uh, probably, I don't know, closer to 200 photographs. But uh, those are, most of them are aerial photographs, a lot of, you know, just to, to really graphically demonstrate as, as, as well as we possibly could the extent of it, the, the intensity of it, the fact that it cannot be denied, um, you know, the fact that many of these stone structures, and once again, we have to assume that once you've done, you know, looked at 20 of them or so, and they all they all show the same uh, pattern of building uh, in terms of being aligned with um, solstices and equinoxes, and the fact that they have various geometric, sacred geometric patterns encoded into their building, we have to assume that most of them, if not all of them, will be built along those principles. Um, otherwise, we would have, we would have already found some that that would not you know be aligned along along those building techniques. So that tells us that whoever was building it, and I believe these were the Anunnaki, obviously, um, that they were doing it with uh, with a great amount of ease um, because they know how to do that. Um, for us to do that today would be very very complicated. It's not simple to do something like this, especially in remote areas. You know, on tops of mountains and side of mountains. Remember that many of these stone structures um, are down very steep slopes, going down the side of a mountain, and and there's you know stone circles lying there at weird angles that you know nobody would ever build a dwelling in a place like that because it just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> You're not going to stay there at a you know 35 degree angle going up the mountain, um, and um, and yet they don't again, fall off. Yeah, and, and then again, you know, the, the other curious thing is that uh, majority of the, the stone circles, especially the original ones, you start to be, after a while when you've been at it for as long as I have now, you start discerning the, the older ones from the less older ones to the more recent ones to the very recent ones. And it's just really based on the manipulation and the reconstruction and the rehabilitation and, and more recent activity by... You know, for example, there's some of these stone structures that you can see activity 50 years ago, then some activity that go back to 100, 110 years to or 112 years to the Anglo-Boer War, the, the English war here that the British came to basically conquer southern Africa to to 
lay their claim on the gold mines and the diamonds. Um, you can see evidence of that. Uh, you can see evidence of the great trek um, when the when the the Boers, the Dutch farmers, left the Cape Colony and moved up and crossed the the Vaal River and you know called it the Transvaal. Um, so there's evidence of all that. Then there's evidence of Bantu tribes um, as they were moving south or Bantu tribes, migrating tribes, inhabiting some of these structures and building mud huts inside of them. And then there's even more mysterious evidence of the the um, Hindu Dravidians, the Makumati people, being active here, you know, as far back as a thousand years, two thousand, even three thousand years ago, they were already here mining gold and trading with gold. Their activity is also encoded and, and left um, behind in some of the stone structures that they re- uh, readapted for their own needs. So it is a an incredible storyline that unfolds in front of you as you start understanding it and seeing the 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 use of these structures by various tribe various peoples over the time. Now, are there any like uh, pottery or uh, clay tablets, like uh, religious texts or political texts, or anything like that? Uh, there are clay, there are uh, clay pottery fragments, a lot of pottery fragments, um, but most of the pottery fragments <coughs> only go go back to you know maybe 500 years max. Um, <coughs> although I must add to that is that not enough research has been done in that field. So what I've just said there now is those are just um, <coughs> immediate assumptions by the historians and archaeologists that find those those. Um, uh, pottery fragments. I've discovered many pottery fragments. I've got plenty of them in my museum. Um, but I think that those pottery fragments are, are they, they seem to be more recent, uh, maybe as far back as 500 years. There is, however, a pottery fragment, or some pottery fragments that I photographed in a cave and I took one sample back with me to the museum, which is on display, which is connected to what is referred to as the Leidenberg Heads culture, or the Leidenberg culture. And these were, um, Leidenberg Heads culture is an interesting um, story. These were these, um, uh, like, masks and head gear made out of uh, pottery, ceramic masks and head, head masks that were found near a town called Leidenberg that I mentioned earlier, where all the gold mines were also discovered. And um, and these are very alien-looking masks, very strange. I believe there were a total of eight of them discovered, either five or eight. Now I, I get confused sometimes between some of the things that I've, <laughs> that I've stumbled upon. Sorry, um, but these masks clearly don't look very human. Um, they're very strange, um, and uh, they become incredibly valuable in in the archaeological circles, worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And um, and what I found was pottery that w- had the same markings as the Leidenberg heads. So the Leidenberg heads um, go back, they estimate that that Leidenberg culture was about um, from 100 AD to about 900 AD, um, somewhere in between there. So, if this pottery is from that same era, then it means we got pottery that could be as, as old as 2,000 years, pottery fragments. So, that's a, that's an interesting discovery as well. Now, I would imagine, though, that if they dug deeper, they could probably find uh, odor under lower strata. Am I correct? Oh, absolutely. The, the, the strata gives away a lot of information, and much of the interesting information we got from the early excavations from Great Zimbabwe by people like uh, Theodore Bent in the late 1800s uh, that gave us phenomenal information because he just wrote it down as it was. You know, he didn't try and find excuses for it. He just called it what it was. And and uh, one of the things he said is that he found between one and a half and two meters of sediments and sedimentation that indicates a gold mining civilization. Now, you know, two meters of sedimentation that indicates gold mining, that, that's a long time, <laughs> a long time of gold mining. Well, if I remember correctly, uh, wasn't Inky the Booze or Abyss 
uh, full of gold? Well, that's um, that's what we had assumed, and they certainly had no shortage of it here. Um, and, uh, another indication of that is... And this book is based on uh, actual archaeological research that you've conducted yourself, am I correct? That's right, yeah. It's, um, it's uh, a, quite an incredible discovery. Well, the, the, the ruins have obviously been there for a long time, um, and they've been a, a center of a lot of speculation and, um, and a lot of you know, writing, but um, nothing really of substance has ever been written about it. It's normally the same kind of speculations about the fact that they belong to, you know, um, migrant tribal, migrant tribes, uh, building them, um, and and so forth. But uh, yeah, the the it, what what is really important about this journey and discovering the stone circles of southern Africa and trying to figure out what on earth they're all about is a is a is a wonderful story in itself. Okay, <clears throat> and in the meantime. Well, okay, I think I'm getting them back. While we're waiting on Mike, I'd like to remind everybody that I've got a busy week this week, so... There's plenty of shows lined up for everybody. Later tonight, I'm going to be interviewing uh, Gloria Brown about invoking the ancient scribes of Egypt. And then I'm going to have another show tomorrow morning, or tomorrow evening, I mean, with Timothy Wally on uh, Confessions of a Rebel Angel. And then this Saturday, uh, Andrea Perron's going to tell us about the movie The Conjuring that's due to hit the uh, theaters on the 19th. Now, um, from what I gather, reading the description of the book, this is a huge, huge area of land that's got a, like a big, vast city built up in it. Uh, you know, can you kind of give us an idea how big the city is? Would it, would it compare to, say, Samaria or somewhere like that? Oh, it's it's huge. You know, what what people can do for themselves is just go, go on to Google Earth. And start looking around Southern Africa and um, look around the towns of um, Waterfall Boven, the little town that I live in, and then the surrounding towns, and just keep moving away from there. Uh, and look around the town of Rustenburg on the way towards Botswana, and um, and you'll start seeing these these large clusters of circular structures. What you'll notice, though on Google Earth immediately is that they are not necessarily visible above the surface. What you're witnessing is actually st structures that are covered by... Mike, are you there? Yeah, I don't seem to be able to get him back. I don't think. Mike, are you there? I'm here. Okay, Mike, we're live on the air, but you appear to be having difficulty on your end. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. It just keeps cutting out. Well, let's see. Let's hope it, um, uh, we, it keeps us connected. Um, maybe um, if I call you, it seems to be stable now. It's lasted longer than before. <laughs> so let's keep going for it. Okay. We'll go ahead and try it. If it cuts out again... What we can do is we can always reschedule, but it'll probably be uh, for the end of July if we have to do that. But let's try to see what we got now. Good. It seems to be stable now. Okay. I was just telling everybody that you was going to tell us today about your most recent book. Um, well, i got to come down to it now. Uh, African Temples to the Anunnaki. Uh, Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Talk Now Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man. 
Uh, joining me today is supposed to be Michael Tellinger. However, he appears to be having some difficulty with his Skype, so we may not be able to conduct this interview. Uh, he had to step away for just one moment, and he's going to come back. And when he does, he's not going to know we're already live on the air. So um, <laughs> going to be some interesting conversation there at first. Um, I thought I'd go ahead and start the show, explain to everybody that he was having trouble. Uh, his call keeps getting dropped. Uh, we don't know why. We may have to reschedule for a, a later date. I doubt we can do one uh, this month. This month's pretty well booked. But with Mike and reschedule for a date in July, well, it looks like I just lost them all together, folks. He may have had to restart his computer. Let's wait and see if he shows back up online. 